Number 10, love don't cost a thing. Okay, we'll kick this one off with a love story. Why not? Let's get motivated out there. The story of Esther and Paul Gratchin. This one goes out to all the single folks watching this at home. Hit that thumbs up if you're single. It'll happen one day. See, Paul has decided on asking Esther to marry him. And around the same time, he caught himself about to spend a dollar bill on a sandwich. But the dollar bill randomly had the name Esther on it. Yeah, what are the odds already? What a coincidence. So he framed it, obviously, this was a bizarre coincidence and Paul recognized this. And when he showed this to Esther, she was speechless, of course. I would have been terrified, but she was speechless, almost as if she'd seen this before. She loved it, but she didn't tell Paul her side of the story until after they had gotten married, until after they had tied the knot. Yeah, what are we missing? What happened? What's the dirty history here? So much earlier, when Esther and a group of friends were all going through a breakup before they were about to get married, they wrote their names on a dollar bill and said, whoever brings this back to them, they'll marry that man. Ah, there we go. Put your name on a bill and then your husband shall return. It's like a Disney princess movie in the making. We love it. Esther didn't tell Paul until after because she was worried that this coincidence would have scared him away, which is more than fair. I would have for sure not believed her. I don't know, it's kind of unbelievable, but what do you think? Is that real? Is that a real story? I think it's real. It's pretty sweet. Number nine, Civil War coincidence. There's another coincidence that's a war-related one, and I saved that for number one. But this one here is also insane. Okay, the Civil War began in 1861 with the first battle of Bull Run, okay? The Bull Run was a stream that passed through the farm of a 56-year-old Wilmer McLean. Now this property of course was in Virginia. Virginia of course once the dust settled the property was destroyed. So McLean left his home and for nearly four years the pair was just removing themselves traveling around while the war was happening. Then in 1865 the war came to a close finally when Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at the Apotomax Courthouse which at the time was literally steps away from McLean's new property. So he literally saw the beginning and the end of the Civil War. He saw it front row too, and he didn't mean to. What are the odds? What a coincidence, right? Number eight, the Hoover Dam coincidence. Okay, it's a pretty grim note, but let's do this. The Hoover Dam, its first victim, sadly, was a man named J.G. Tierney. It was December 20th, 1922, and the official death toll from the industrial accidents during the construction of said dam from 1921 to 1935 was around 213 souls. So it was a dangerous job. A lot of people were losing their lives. The earliest and latest victims of the construction were both father and son. Tragic, but a coincidence nonetheless. And if that's not coincidental enough, both of them died on the same day. December 20th. J.G. Tierney sadly drowned while conducting surveys in the Colorado River, and then 13 years later, Patrick Tierney fell off an intake tower right before construction was complete. Father and son, first and last, same day. That's like three and one, that's bizarre. Number seven, Stephen Hawking's. We gotta throw in a fun Stephen Hawking's coincidence, right? Of course, those are always terrifying to find out after the fact. Time is relative, and it's also fascinating and horrifying. There's so many components of our universe that we still don't understand. James Webb's out here changing everyone's lives just by clicking one photo, you know what I mean? That's, that one photo is now my background on my computer. It's gorgeous. Science is nuts. The universe is a lot bigger than we all think, yet somehow it still gives us these once in a lifetime coincidences, right? Somehow we're watching this like, what are the odds? Stephen Hawking's death occurred on Einstein's 139th birthday, which is also Galileo's 300th death day. And also it's the Pi Day, it's also March 14th, my favorite day of the year. Shout out to all the nerds. My dad has the same birthday as Daniel Radcliffe, and they're both wizards, so I don't know, that's coincidence as well. Number six, Anthony Hopkins' book search. Okay, didn't think I'd be as jazzed as I am right now for Anthony Hopkins, but here we go. In the 70s, Anthony Hopkins was set to play Kostya in a film adaptation of The Girl from Petrogovka. Now, to prepare for the role like any great actor would, he did some homework. He set out to read the book, but was unable to find a copy in any bookstore, despite being Anthony Hopkins. Then, while sitting in a London train station, he noticed a copy of that exact book that someone had left behind. What are the odds? And then when he opened it, he found that that book, that exact copy, had also been signed by its author, George Pfeiffer. Classic. This never happens to not Anthony Hopkins, eh? It's always, always happens to people who narrate the Grinch. Number five, no coincidence, no story. Stephen and Helen Lee, they just got engaged when they soon figured out these details that ruined said engagement almost immediately. It went from, yay, congrats, to, uh, sorry, what? What did you just say? So what happened? Okay, here we go. While looking through family photos during their engagement party in New York, having a good time, they realized that the bride's mother and the groom's late father 
were so close to getting married themselves. Yeah, they had dated before. Keep it in the family, I guess. Let's do it. They were meant to get married in Korea way back in the 1960s, but sadly, they moved on to other relationships because their parents disapproved of their relationship. Yeah, it wasn't the love, it was the barriers. That adds to the holy shitness of this, right? Imagine telling that to your grandkids though. Okay, you won't believe what almost happened. Let's get the grandkids in here. Let's get the grand, let's get everyone in here. Number four, what's up dog? The dying Aboriginal language in Australia, Mbabram, is of course extremely unique and of course extremely old. It's ancient, right? But oddly, this is a bizarre coincidence. Oddly, linguists studying in Babarim realized that the tribe's word for dog is our English word dog, with no connection at all to the English word or its roots. Same dog dog, right? Sounds exact same. The coincidence is technically considered a false cognate since they sound the same, but the only coincidence in fact is that they share a meaning. But that's still mind-blowing nonetheless. I had to throw it in. That's crazy. This is a lesson to read more books. Yeah, I'm talking to you. We know nothing, Jon Snow. Start reading some more books. Number three, George D. Bryson. Okay, back in the 50s, this story was spread all over Kentucky and it's still going around apparently. Back in the 50s in Louisville, Kentucky, a man named George D. Bryson was checking into a hotel room. He walked up, did a little hotel tap with his fingers. He walked up and asked if there was any mail for him. Which, you know, on one hand, that's a great bit. That's an excellent bit. At a hotel specifically, obviously there's no mail for him. That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. I'm doing this next time at a hotel, for sure. Hey, got any mail? <laughs> Classic. Where's the ice machine? It's a good bit. Except this time, the hotel manager said, why yes, there is mail. There is in fact mail for you. There was mail for the guy from the previous occupant who also had the same name George D. Bryson. I'm, bl this is, I'm blown, this is crazy, I, what? I remember one time I met another guy named McWaters. His last name was McWaters, and he did not give a that he was not. I was like, hey, we have the same last name. He was like, oh, we're not related. I'm like, I know, isn't that crazy? He didn't give a <laughs> Number two, Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, this story convinced me that Edgar Allan Poe is a time traveler. So buckle up, grab a soda, this one's a little bit long. Because two separate stories that he wrote both turned out to be true and real, but not until after they'd been written. Coincidence, or just from the future, just insane, I guess. Firstly, Poe's only completed novel was published in 1838, and it tells the tale of mutiny on a whaling ship lost at sea, right? The classic. Now, the men on the ship realize that they need to resort to extreme measures in order to stay alive, so they begin drawing straws to see who they're going to sacrifice for food. A boy named Richard Parker drew the shortest straw and therefore became the sacrifice. Okay, let's fast forward 46 years to 1884. Now in real life, there are four men who have been set adrift after the sinking of a yacht. Real life, 1884. These men found themselves in the same situation to the novels, and I kid you not, they ended up taking the same route, and they elected to sacrifice somebody on board. That same somebody happened to be named Richard Parker. Pretty odd, right? Already you're like, oh, satisfied. Let's move on with the list. Nope, there's more. Cut to 1840. Pope had the gruesome story, The Businessman, in which the narrator suffers a traumatic head injury in his youth, and then later, a violent life follows, right? The weird thing about this story is that Edgar Allan Poe fully understood frontal lobe injury. This was long before it was ever even looked at or studied professionally, right? This type of study didn't arrive until 1848. An actual neurologist, Eric Altshuler, recently wrote how there's a dozen symptoms and Edgar Allan Poe knew every single one. It's so exact and weird, it's coincidental, and it's also terrifying. This man is from the future. And finally, number one, World War I soldiers. Okay, we have to finish on a grim note. Also, I told you that there's another war one, so I'm true to my word. This is one of the most bizarre coincidences I've ever heard, in my humble opinion. When the First World War ended, the amount of British lives lost were around one million souls. That's a lot, obviously. The first reported casualty of World War I was a soldier named John Parr first reported. Then after a countless number of lives were lost, the last soldier to die officially was a man named George Edwin Ellison. Both heroes' resting places are in the St. Symphorian Military Cemetery, and they just happen to be 15 feet apart from one another. This was not planned, of course, nor were there any entries in this list. It's just a bizarre coincidence that was discovered after the fact. So of course we had to save it for last. That's probably the most bizarre coincidence I've heard in my life. Number 10. Abe the Wrestler. At 20 years old with a record of 300 fights and one loss, he stands 6'4 inches at 185 pounds. Your future president of the United States, Honest Abe, the chair, give him the chair. That's right, Abe Lincoln was quite the ruffian. However, the wrestling back then wasn't as organized as there was no WWF per se. It was mostly just a show of strength and skill, but there were competitions among men. Huge crowds gathered, towns watched, everybody gambled, it was great. 
a little wrestling. His fights earned him respect while campaigning too. He would even scrap hecklers at debates. Yeah, just walks down midpoint and Wheeler whips someone under their neck. His chirps were amazing too. He would just look at people like Gladiator and call them out. He'd be like, hey, I'm the big buck of this lick. If any of you want to try it, come on and get your wet horns. Yeah, I didn't think so. Sorry, Mr. Douglas, proceed. Thank you. Number nine, Roy Sullivan. They say lightning never strikes the same place twice, but if you knew Roy Sullivan, you knew that's not entirely true. Yeah, meet the man who was struck by lightning seven times and lived to tell the tale. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912. He sadly passed away in 1983 when he was 71 years old, but God tried, God tried a few times to get him out earlier, it seems. He was born in Greene County, Virginia. Roy was a park ranger in Shenandoah National Park in 1936. He was nicknamed the Human Lightning Conductor, and he appeared in the Guinness Book of World Records. Roy's first encounter with, you know, the might of Thor, was when he was just 30 years old at the Fire Lookout Tower. He said that lightning strike, again, out of the seven he survived, was the most painful out of all of them. The lightning bolts burned a strip all the way down his leg, even blowing a hole through his shoe. Yet somehow he survived. Roy was also hit by lightning in 1969 while driving a truck, and also in 1970 while gardening on an otherwise clear day like today, also in 1972 while inside a guardhouse, also in 1976 during another storm, and finally in 1977 while fishing. Yeah, Roy passed away in 1983, and to this day, two of his ranger hats are on display at the Guinness World Exhibits in New York City and South Carolina. This man cheated death eight times. Seven. Number eight, Miss Unsinkable. Violet Constant Jessup, AKA the queen of sinking ships, or Miss Unsinkable, was an Argentine Irish woman who worked as an ocean liner stewardess, memoirist, and Red Cross nurse in the early 20th century. Jessup is well known for having survived three sinkings of major ships the RMS Olympic in 1911, the RMS Titanic in 1912, and her sister, the HMHS Britannic in 1916. Yeah, talk about the luckiest person ever. Lady's got some angels watching over her, I swear. The first ship, they turned around and made it back just in time. The Titanic, well, watch the movie, you'll understand. And then the third ship, it must have just felt personal by that point. Really? Not to mention barely surviving tuberculosis as a child. This woman is truly a saint. Returning to work after all those accidents, dedicating her entire life to the Red Cross, trying to save others, sadly she passed away at 83. Number seven, lost at sea. The Robertson family, they're quite a historical one. Strap in, folks. Back in 1971, Dougal, Lynn, and their four children, and Douglas, Neil, and Sandy, all set sail on what was planned to be a trip around the world. It sounds magnificent. Our family saw a movie once. Aboard their 13 meter boat, the Lucette, they traveled through the Caribbean and then across the Panama Canal to the Pacific, right? That was their trail. A year and a half went by, they were on route through the Galapagos and one of the daughters, Anne, who was 18, decided to leave the voyage. Yeah, she's like, ah, you know what? I'm actually not on board for this anymore. I'm really seasick, bye. And then in Panama, they took on a hitchhiker named Robin Williams great name. This hitchhiker was in for more of an adventure than they thought, because after this point, their lives were never the same again. West of the Galapagos Islands, a pod of killer whales struck the boat. Wood then began to crack and the boat subsequently started to sink. They all moved to the inflatable life raft, but after 16 days of using their own breath to keep inflating it over and over 24-7, the six of them were sadly forced to relocate into an even smaller dinghy. Then they somehow survived for 38 days at sea, while sailing towards the center of the Pacific with no goal in mind other than to survive. All they had to drink was some water left over from the Lucette, with sea turtles being their only diet. Yeah, save the turtles, unless of course you're stranded at sea. Then in that case, sorry to 52 of you. Finally, after 38 days, they were spotted by a passing Japanese fishing boat, and then thankfully they were rescued. Number six, Mad Jack Churchill. No, not that Churchill, but equally as British and even bolder. Mad Jack Churchill, AKA, John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill was a British army officer who fought in the Second World War with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Dude, this guy lived a life. Was in like every war. Trained people how to fight and how to parachute. This guy was fighting machine guns with a bow and a sword. And was at like the front of the lines, leading them. Taunting people, playing the bagpipes. You know how intimidating that is? How is there not like 15 movies about this guy? Not only did he thrive in the rough stuff, guy revolutionized surfing. 
He was also pissed the Americans dropped some nukes. He wanted to keep fighting, you know? Like imagine that pep talk. Alright lads, I'm going to play a wee jingle here first and then I'm going to go out and take this sword and I'm going to start swinging. Alright, good luck. Number 5. Fake France Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of, you know, seeing their city of love get blown to smithereens, as one would. So they figured, you know what, let's try and fool those Germans, right? Let's try and do some trickery. Let's just build a fake Paris and then shut out all the lights. And it worked. Yeah, they psyched them out. They created a decoy, a very large decoy. The life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. This tiny town called Mason's Lafayette, now of course it's looking a lot more full than it was when it was, you know, a hollow shell of a fake town, now it's a tourist area. There were once three different zones set up around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations, mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake Gare du Nord train station, right? That was the main pull. Like, hey, come on, we're looking nice and Hopeful, come attack us, and it worked. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafayette, the main fake Paris, right? And zone C was the industrial area, just east of the city. They had massive factories built with, you know, obviously nothing inside of them. This sounds pretty home alone when you think of it, but these missions only happening overnight, creating a light show with some big fancy props isn't a bad idea. It's gonna save a lot of lives and money. Lights were carefully spaced out so it looked like a breathing city from above, and they fell for it for some of the time. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. <laughs> yeah, it's Paris. Hit that really fast. It's good. Number four, space junk. In 1961, John Glenn would become the first astronaut to successfully orbit in space. He lapped the Earth a couple times with the help of Friendship 7, NASA's command mission pushing ever closer and closer to the moon. While in space, Glenn and fellow crew noticed tiny gold particles that shone like fireflies. Quote, uh, this is Friendship 7, uh, I'll try to describe what I'm seeing up here. Uh, it's a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like uh, they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it, they're around a little, they're coming out of the capsule and they just look like stars, a whole shower of them coming over, over. They had come to the conclusion, it was liquid from inside the capsule and the suits leaking out. And that liquid was urine. Not aliens, not fireflies, not disintegrating ship, frozen pee pee. Ew. Yeah, guess drinking all that tang all day. Glenn flew on Discovery in 1998 and became at age 77 the oldest person to fly in space at the time. Damn Shatner. Number three, Project MDXX. If you've seen Project X, this one's gonna ring a bell or two. About 500 years ago, yep, you missed it, in 1520, for two and a half weeks in June, both England's King Henry VIII and Francis Francis I, two of the greatest monarchs in Renaissance Europe, they both threw a joint birthday party that lasted 18 days, and it only cost about $19 million by today's standards. Nice. I went mini putting for my eighth birthday. That's why I called it Project MDXX, the numerals in the year, yeah, you get it, not bad. Not only was this a chance for them to celebrate their friendship, but it was also a chance for them to try and outdo one another and continue to show off. So for this huge bash, for starters, around 12,000 people showed up and gathered in the fields of the northern tip of what is now France. All tents, costumes, decorations were all gold embellished. Guests were fed 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,400 birds, 2,200 sheep, and 216,000 gallons of wine just to wash all that clout down. Mm. On top of that, there were jousts, wrestling matches, elaborate mask parties. I have FOMO just talking about it right now. The two kings both wanted to outdo each other, but there were rules put in place beforehand. These kings could not compete with one another during the celebrations, right? So instead, they tried to outspend each other in a nice way. They're like, oh yes, look at all of my gold. No, look at all my gold. We love blowing all of our resources in two and a half weeks. Nice. Looking good, guys. Keep it up. Number two, Olympic arts. In the early 20th century, the Olympics were getting creative, literally. Hundreds of years of blood, sport, and victorious games, and people were looking for some new events. 1912, Summer Olympics, they decided to add official awarded medals for painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, and music. All right. One rule, though. They had to be of Olympic sport nature. Paintings of people boxing, sculptures of people whipping discs around, and of course, a couple doodles of some dudes playing rugby. Which won Gene Jacoby two gold medals. Of course, these were Olympic grade pieces of art. So you know they were the best of the best. Of course, you could compete in both sport and art. American athlete Walter Winnens took the podium after winning gold in sharpshooting, and also the very first gold in sculpture. Yeah, 
Lovely. He made a little bronze horse pulling a chariot. Isn't that nice? People just taping up their wrists, mouth guards in, and you're just sharpening your pencil. Hey, how are you? About to draw. <laughs> Good luck. And finally, number one, Jurassic Timeline. All right, this one goes out to all the T-Rexes out there. If you're watching, hit that thumbs up with your little hands. Nice big reach. Hit that subscribe button. When we think of the times of the dinosaurs, we tend to think of all of them roaming the planet at one time, and then a meteor hit, and then they were all toast. But that is certainly not the case. It's a little shocking, but here's our timeline. Dinosaur communities were not only spread apart by geography, but also by time and the age of the dinosaurs. For one, it lasted so long that it included three separate geological time periods. It's a long time. Fun fact, there is more time separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from the Stegosaurus than there is separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from humans. Yeah, that's how long ago dinosaurs have been kicking, or not kicking rather, you know what I mean? We can't comprehend this time. Like this is so far away, it doesn't even make sense. We think of the ancient Egyptians, we're like, oh, that's, I don't know. Dinosaurs? Stegosaurus, you know those herbivores with the plates on their back and the spiky tails, they always do this and take out your cars, whatever, Jurassic World, I've seen it. They roamed Earth 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period and the age of the dinosaurs. And then the T-Rex first appeared about 80 million years after the Stegosaurus had been extinct. And that was about, you know, 67 million years ago from today. This means that while 80 million years separated those two, there's only 67 million years that separate us from a T-Rex. Crazy fact. Uh, hit that thumbs up.